I'm sharing with you. But it is all very evolving. You know, tomorrow we might have a different point. Tell us that I have seen, have been in Aliga. I have seen the best stories. <laughs> than an AI, uh, you know, uh, can do. The only spiritual and ethical, moral fear that I have with AI, and this is something I'm sharing with you, but it is all very evolving. You know, tomorrow we might have a different point of view, and that is God gave us free will. All right, one of the differences between us and the angels was that God gave us free will. And what a lot of us might end up doing is outsource that free will to AI. And it's almost like throwing back the ball at God Almighty. No, Lubilla, you know, in terms of saying, you know, I'm not good enough to handle this. You know, please let something else do this for me. So to me, that is the ethical and moral, you know, dilemma that we all have to, you know, kind of be concerned and, and worried about. Because at the end of the day, we are, you know, uh, and the other thing is, you know, from a non-spiritual angle, what you don't use gathers dust, right? And then you start depending, uh, people uh, depended on their wives for instructions, then they depended on Google, now they depend on Siri, and then they will depend on uh, uh, the wife of the joke, by the way. Right? <laughs> anyway, so uh, thank you so much for having me, uh, and uh, it's a real uh, you know, pleasure to be here. I want to start this session by asking you a question. Who are the world's best storytellers. So, who are the world's best storytellers? Politicians. Oh, yes. Okay. But you know, their stories are so, you see through them. They, so, they're, they're not, they're very pretentious because you, you they're so, you know, predictive. All right. Huh? Nani's. Okay. Who else? Who? Sorry? Good listeners. Good listeners. Good listeners. Okay. All right. Yes. All right. Movie directors. Movie directors. Okay. Do you know that your answers are not wrong? All right. It won't get you the, the, the position yet. You know. But the best storytellers that I have seen have been in Aligarh. I have seen the best stories. <laughs> all right. Come out of. Uh, you know, students uh, sitting in front of the canteen. All right. Uh, I was telling Parvez Bhai that uh, you know my first tutoring in storytelling was. The attendance was come short of the so I mean, not to set up set a bad example. But jab kabi short hoti thi, so to go and present a, a reason, a creative, convincing reason. As to sir, aap mere liye kyu karne aur agli baar aapko kyu karne ki zarurat nahi padegi. So that was my first this thing. And then this is a place called Mud Island. All right, this is Jamia Urdu Mud Island. It is where I spent a lot of my time, and this is where I met the gentleman called Ek Sahab. Because Aligarh mein Ek Sahab ye kon hai? Aaj tak kisi ko pata nahi chala. Sare tasse were always attributed to Ek Sahab. Ek Sahab se suna, Ek Sahab keh rahe the, Ek Sahab ye tha, Ek Sahab ho tha. So yaha pe main Ek Sahab se meri mulaqat Aligarh mein hui and I learned. Uh, now there was this other place, Canteen Cafe, Delilah. Yaha pe alag tarah ki guftabu ho di thi. Yaha pe aap matlab namaiz ke, kis kis ko dekha, kya kya. You know, you guys understand what where I'm going with this. And, this, and the lubricant or the catalyst for storytelling was always this. <laughs> All right. I mean, a cup of tea could best, you know, could take out the best stories in people. And then it was always that you know who's going to. Uh, so there's another cafe in uh, on, in uh, I mean Nisha Chora, and uh, I won't take names because it's an embarrassing story. But there was this friend of ours who would always come, and he would pick up, uh, you know, the tea, and would start sipping, and then would walk away. Yeah, मतलब आदत सी हो गई थी. लड़कों को predictably मालूम था ये आ रहा है. So one of the boys said, इसमें थोड़ा सा जमाल गोटा. And this guy was an athlete. 
he was a fantastic athlete. He was a sprinter and he could jump and you know. So, Pia Chai, so he said, I'm going to get a hat. 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 I'm Anyway, so on that note, I wanted to tell you the message here is that Aligarh is a wonderful place to learn storytelling. Aligarh is a talim har tarah ki hoti hai. Classroom ki talim hoti hai. Dhabo mein ek talim hoti hai. You learn to be knowledgeable in the classroom. You learn to be wise at the dhabas. All right? And uh, this is something that I think is a great asset. And jo Aligarh ki tehzeeb, jisko kaha jata hai, ki Aligarh ki tehzeeb ko is a very talked about, you know, kind of uh, asset. And that tehzeeb comes from these two places. You learn how to, so for example, abhi bhi, very bad, mein abhi Dubai gaya tha, to I was out for a meal with a few Aligarians. And suddenly they, you know, when it was time and I kind of reached for my wallet, they said, kya Aligarh ki tehzeeb bhol gaya to, tum the junior ho. So, you know, they did not let me pay because, you know, they were seniors. And this is an age-old Aligarian, you know, tradition that has always, uh, you know, uh, been there. All right. So, do not underestimate yourself. All right. Aligarh is a great place, you know, to learn storytelling. And, and through this presentation, you will learn and hopefully I will be able to convince you how storytelling is one of the biggest assets and skill sets, all right, that you must have in order to be successful in business life, whether you are in marketing or whether you are not in marketing. Even finance storytelling happens, all right. People look at balance sheets and tell a story, all right. They learn how to tell, you know, what, what is the story that is coming out of a balance sheet, all right. That's also something that, uh, you know, so storytelling as a skill set is extremely but we cannot continue this session without recognizing the person that started this whole thing. An idea that became a story, a story that became a narrative, a narrative that became a movement, a movement that transformed communities, transformed communities that built a nation. All right? Whether it is our nation or it is the nation that sits beside us. Right? My father used to tell me, God bless his soul, that in 1947, at one point in time, for a few years, for let's say till up to the 1950s, 55, he said that the entire bureaucracy of Pakistan were all illegals. The entire bureaucracy, the ruling class, the whole management of that country was done by illegals. And I mean, if you look at the history of India, you know, uh, the alumni of uh, AMU have really so I think we, whenever we talk about our story, we talk about the story of the institution, we cannot forget the, uh, the idea of uh, you know, our founder. And, our, and I'm saying this with a lot of passion and a lot of belief. One of the responsibilities that we have as inheritors of a great story is to protect it is to prevent it from being corrupted, prevent it from being hijacked, and prevent it from being taken over by a certain agenda that is other than what that, you know, the founder of the institution wanted to uh, project. So that is a responsibility that belongs to everybody, whether you're a student or whoever you are, as an inheritor of this story, I think we have a very important responsibility to keep. So, I want to, I mean, a lot of my story has been told, so there's, uh, I'm not going to tell you how many years I have, in fact, one of the things I thought to myself, chairman junior log hone lagenge tab mujhe padhate ka ehsaas hone lagega. Uswat Jamal bhai was a young teacher. He was just about in, or you know, he had a few years, but he was one of the young teachers, and uh, but still, he was my teacher, and uh, you know, so uh, having him as the chairman is still, I feel young. But the moment there is somebody junior to me, after me who becomes the chairman, then I will start feeling a little 
old. But sorry, I want to tell you two small stories, very quick stories, and because they, I hope that at the end of it, they inspire you. One of the story was, as all of us, we, you know, summer training was a big challenge. In those, I'm sure the university has made a lot of, you know, progress in terms of industry and corporate relations and things like. In those days, there were not that many. Uh, you know, uh, relationships that we had. It was all about us going to, you know, find our own summer training assignments. So I had a Kawasaki 100 in those days, uh, and I took it. I made some about 100 photocopies of my resume, and I was in Connaught Place, and not me, my entire batch. We were all, we, were, we would meet at uh, a few places for lunch or for this or for that, but generally, we would take so many summer resumes. And we were making cold calls because a lot of people had the proverbial Ligarian word Jugar, but my parents were in Nigeria, they lived abroad, my family was a university family, so we had really no nobody we knew in the industry. So I was totally, you know, on my own. I had nobody to, you know, no uncle aunt or anybody to kind of help me. So when I was, uh, by the way, before I, when I finished my BSc and before I did my MBA, I went to the Times School of Marketing in uh, Delhi for a year. And then after finishing that, I came back and then I did my MBA in Aliyah. During my, you know, uh, tenure at the Times School of Marketing, one of the visiting faculties was the general manager of Pepsi. Uh, and their office was in Mohandev building in uh, Connaught Place. So I went there and I climbed to the 14th floor to give my resume to the reception and you know generally try to meet him. I was told he's on leave, he will not be here for one month and you know and I was very disappointed because I was very active in his class and I thought that you know he would take me on. So while I was walking the stairs down, I came up with the lift but I was walking the stairs down, on the ninth floor I saw these bunch of very energetic people smoking cigarettes in the corridor, you know, in the lift, uh, shaft, uh, whatever, the staircase shaft. And then I looked in and I saw a signboard saying Lintax. And I said, Chodo, yaar, what is there to lose? There's some puppy hand. I said, I left my resume. They said, yeah, we don't have any vacancies, but we'll see. We'll, we'll let you know. And uh, I barely reached home that evening and I got a call from Lintax saying that uh, there is a project opportunity for us. Uh, come and meet us tomorrow at 10 in the morning. I went back there and the deputy general manager met me and he said two things. One is, I will not for you no stipend. All right. The second thing is, this is about the launch of a whiskey brand. All right. Uh, so are you going to take it on? And I was like very thoroughly confused. It was not the stipend. All right. It was handling a whiskey brand. And I didn't know what to do. And I just thought to myself, okay, Kya is a very, you know, kind of a difficult situation. And uh, I asked him, I said, uh, you know, will it in, in, involve trials? Will it involve, you know, getting people to do anything? Or, you know, basically, I want to know if my work is going to make people drink more. You know, and he said, no, 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 it's just about a strategy about how do we launch the brand and things like that. And then I spoke to a few people and they said, Vita, you don't do this. When you get to work, then you don't have to work on this kind of brand. Now, you have to take the opportunity to take the opportunity. And uh, I don't know, to be honest with you, I still don't know whether I did the right thing or the wrong thing. Allah, forgive me forgive if it was wrong, but I took on the challenge and I took the uh, it was a very interesting assignment for something you have never tried, you have never touched, you don't even know about, you haven't seen anybody in your family consume, you haven't seen, you know, when I reached MBA second year, I started discovering people, anyway, that's a different thing, people here that also consume alcohol. But till then, even in Aligarh, I had not seen anybody, I had not known anybody, you know, who uh, uh, consumed alcohol. So it was an extremely, you know, difficult job to handle. I did that. I did that uh, program. My report is, I think, somewhere in the department. And I'm proud to tell you that based on that work, the head of Lintas in those days was Preet K.S. Bedi. 
He used to be a Doordarshan news reader as well as Sardar. And before I left the, uh, uh, you know, for Aligarh, he told the HR head that don't let him leave without seeing me. And I was, I went to say my byes and everything. And the first thing the HR manager said that Preet said that he wants us to pay you a stipend in, in, uh, you know, as areas for the entire period that you were here. And he wants us to give you a bonus which is a taxi fare back to your hometown in, uh, you know, Aligarh. In those days, taxi fare, I mean, I met Preet and then he asked me, what do you want to do in life? Do you want to join advertising? I said, sir, I, I, I don't know, it's too early, I have to explore, I have to do, you know, I gave him a vague answer. And then he gave me an appointment letter dated one year in advance, uh, one year, you know, in advance saying that I'm going to make this difficult for you. You are not going to be able to choose anything else because I'm giving you an appointment to join Lintas starting after your second year. So Alhamdulillah, I got my appointment at the end of my summer training in first year, you know, at MBA. So that is my first story. The second story was when I did join Lintas. All right, and uh, exams were not finished here. Lintas had started early, and we, I don't know, there was, in those days, there were a lot of these strikes, this and that, our exams got delayed. So I finished the exams and I reported to uh, Lintas. When I reached there, I discovered that I had the title called Executive Trainee. And there were these others who had a title called Management Trainee. And my salary in those, in 1994, was 4,460 rupees. All right? Cut And that to And that to me was, you know, intellectual racism. Because these guys were from I am Ahmedabad, I am Calcutta, I am Bangalore, and there was I am everywhere. And the next or the slightly second generation you know, institutions was XLRI, FMS from Delhi, and then there was Sam Hussaini from AMU, Aligarh. All right. Uh, in those days, we were not even yet a faculty. We were still called Department of, M you know, FMSR, Nambi, Thikser, Akhani, Yathauswa. And Linta, sorry, I'm telling a long story, but I will pick up pace in the other part of the presentation because this is very important for your... Lintas had five divisions. Lintas 1 was the NASA unit of Lintas. This is where all the Unilever brands were handled. So rain, surf, wheel, and only IM students used to make it in there. All right, and Lintas had a training program for six months after taking, on us, taking us on as a trainee, in which we were sent to different departments and we were awarded marks. And I decided to myself, I said, I am not going to let this I am thing stick. All right. And I worked so hard. I brought, you know, I mean, I, I brought out, I, you know, kind of reached to the depths of my passion and to my motivation to say that I am not going to be treated as a second citizen. And Allah ka rehmo karam hai that I was on the top of the list of that training program. And I was the first to be appointed in Lintas Bombay 1 and I was given a choice between Wheel, Rin, and Surf Excel to uh, pick as a brand. So, Dark Dhunte Rajaoge, Safai Ka Tufan, or Ek Chutki Rin, you know, these were all uh, campaigns that I worked on. So, <laughs> the moral of this story, guys, is you are what you want to become, all right? You have it in you. Everybody has it in you. I was from the same environment, the same situation. You have better facilities. You have a wonderful campus. All right. We had a, if you ever pass Chungi, go and take a look at that building. That is where we, I mean, but we were, we loved it. To be honest, it was home. We enjoyed it and, uh, uh, and everything. And uh, whether it was the AMA politics of those elections we used to do and things, I don't know whether they still happen, but it was all good fun. So you have it in you to really, you know, kind of make it big. And at the end of the day, where you come from 
matters only a little bit. What you put on the table and the value you create and the consistency with which you create that value is what determines your success. All right, and ham logon ka matlab kaam hai koshish karna, mehnat karna, aur inshallah Allah ko uska ajar zaroor dega. So on that note, that's the end of my story. I just wanted to share that with you before we move on. So coming to the name that was very difficult to pronounce. Uh, <clears throat> I'm from. A, I I founded a company called Procreagence. Procreagence is a word. It doesn't exist in the dictionary. It's a word made out of proactivity, creativity, and intelligence. I kind of crushed it together, and we have the word procreagence. So procreagence is our attitude. We are a marketing, uh, integrated marketing solutions company, and we are all about unlocking brand potential. All right, and we believe that it takes proactivity, creativity, and intelligence in a combined form to be able to unlock brand potential. So we are a marketing, digital, and communication solutions firm. Uh, what do we do? We work for startups. So startups that are looking for a brand, we create brands for them. I offer my services as a fractional market chief marketing officer. So a lot of startups who can't afford a very senior marketing person hire me for five days a month, six days a month, ten days a month, and then I help them kind of uh, get a scale up. Also, clients that are feeling boxed or feeling, you know, that they they're not able to, they're getting the same old, same old kind of, you know, how they want to break free. We, we help them do that. A lot of clients feel that their reality is better than their perception, and they want to fix that gap. And that is, those are clients that we help. And then, if you are expecting a bet, better return on investment, our purpose, and our brand purpose, is really unlocking your brand's potential. And empowering growth with proactivity, creativity, and intelligence, and that is what we deliver to our clients. Uh, how do we create value? One is through our attitude, which is proactivity, creativity, and intelligence. We are relentlessly result-oriented. Right? At the end of the day, I tell my clients that I'm willing to take 10% of my fee as a percentage of the growth we deliver. All right? So I put skin in the game. And they then feel that your commitment to what you are prescribing to them, all right, is very high because of that skill in the game. Value innovation. We are all in the red ocean, all right. Taking clients out of the red ocean into the blue ocean, in terms of helping them look at, reinterpret their markets, look at their competition in a different way, recalibrating themselves in a fresh uh, way. That's something we do. And then we have agile, low cost output. Procreagence is a virtual organization. I don't have an office, and no matter how big we become, we will never have a physical office. I have invested in the tech side of things. We have cloud services, online servers. I have teams sitting in different locations. We have video conferencing facilities. I have uh, collaboration portals for the different people that work with me to kind of engage in. So, despite the fact that we don't have a physical office. We still have an organizational culture, which is extremely important to us. What do we deliver? Behavior modifying work, work that creates talkability and makes you famous, and also unlocking business growth. But above all of this, I have three buckets. All right, that every client must help me fill. If any one of these buckets is not filled, I don't take that client on. All right, and that is the fun, the funds, and the fame. If it is not fun working for a client, I don't work with them, because at the end of the day, we, you know, uh, uh, brand building is an art of passion. It comes from your heart. If there is no fun in doing it, there is no point in, in wasting your time with that client. If there are no funds, all right, it doesn't help. And if there is no fame, it doesn't make the client famous, or it doesn't make us famous. I don't take it. So these, this is my checklist in which I choose. Which line they come on? And the last slide on us is we have relationships in India and the Middle East. I started out in, in 2020, right at the start of lock. The lockdown is when I launched Procreagence, and Alhamdulillah, not a single month has passed without us having work to do. And uh, I was able to leverage my relationship, 18-year relationships in the Middle East, India. 
So I grew up in Nigeria, so I have you know uh, people I know there as well. So um, we have we have clients you know uh, in India and across the world. So I'm also proud to say that Progressions from day one was a multinational organization. All right. So that was about Progressions. All right. That's the now that was my corporate storytelling. All right. That was again an example of storytelling, not just belonging to brands. You know, when you make a presentation, you're telling a story. When you're talking about yourself and you're selling yourself, you tell a story. All right. And then I was thinking about the theme, even though you know the theme was about you know uh, storytelling in the age of you know. I, I said that's a little on the surface. Can we dig a little deeper in terms of peeling the onion, as they say? And I came up with the idea that it's from campfires to algorithms. All right. And the reason why I thought so is that when God decided to talk to man, he used stories. Whether it is in the Holy Quran, whether it is in the Gita. In the Ramayana, in the Bible, in the Torah, or whatever religious book you uh, believe in, you will see that God, even in His, uh, you know, engagement and communication with man, I mean, spoke directly as well as spoke through stories. So storytelling is such a powerful tool that even. I mean, the Almighty. I mean, has used it in engaging and communicating with us. Do you know that storytelling predates the invention of language? All right, prehistoric man started telling stories in the caves even when language was not invented. They were doing it through cave drawings. All right, they were telling stories of the famine, stories of the hunter, stories of the wars. Stories of their conflict, stories of their love, and stories of you know, I mean, whatever of the of, of their expansion as as a tribe. All right, can you guys see? Do I do that? Yes. So it is a very old uh, you know uh, form of uh, uh, thing, and storytelling has, is is it is if you go to a, a, a psychiatrist. I mean, I hope nobody has visited a psychiatrist. But the first thing the psychiatrist, you know, ask or a counselor would ask you to do is tell me your story. All right. Two reasons. One is they want you, they want to understand where you're coming from, and the second reason is that in telling your story, you are detoxing yourself. There is a certain emotional relief that you get in terms of a story. Well, you know, where that at least I have told my story and somebody has listened to me. All right, there has been some empathy on the other side. So storytelling is a deep psychological, uh, you know, uh, tool, and therefore, as marketers and brand storytellers, mastering the science of how this should be done is extremely important. Because at the end of the day, you must have learned a lot of definitions for marketing, but the one that stuck with me. Was marketing is all about moving people from what they currently think, feel, and do to what you want them to think, feel, and do. All right, and making that journey from point A to point B is what marketing is all about. It is as simple as this, and there is a certain psychological, you know, science that is involved in terms of structuring your narrative in a manner that people feel good. All right. Don't feel compelled. Actually, feel that it's a natural transition. All right, to make from point A to point B. So, storytelling is influenced by AI. That's the white elephant in the room. Let's quickly talk about it. See, I've talked about AI. Let's not make too much about AI. All right. AI is a fad. AI is important. AI is 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 you know. But AI does not replace the basic crux and the axis around which storytelling is developed, and stories are, you know, kind of uh, told. So, you know, people choose to use AI, and because it's a fad, it's now finding its place in everything. Today, you look at LinkedIn, 
most of the posts are some in some form talking about AI. You look at a lot of advertising and they're trying to leverage AI. And here's an example of one of those. <laughs> So, I mean, it's a vacuum cleaner that cleans your house. All right, now AI is going to decide that is a COVID virus and that is not, you know, I mean, it doesn't work like that. But it is, people are leveraging this whole, uh, you know, AI thing uh, in a big way. And I don't want you to, I want you to recognize the value of what it is. And it is valuable. And here are some examples of what AI does in terms of branding. So, point number one, data-driven insights, all right? AI helps in a lot of data mining, helps in a, and basically it's not that it does anything that you were not able to do before. What took you three days, it does in three seconds, all right? So that's the advantage that AI is, is, is kind of, so finding, I, I love using this term, and please remember this, write it down, insights that insight, all right? There are different kinds of insights. But there are some insights that insight, and as an in I-N-C-I-T-E, which is insight action. So it's extremely important. These are some smart phrases you use in your interviews, and you know your interviewer will be, will, will be confident. All right. So, but insights that insight are extremely important, and it takes a very keen, experienced eye to be able to identify and prioritize insights in a certain way. Now, AI does that in a matter of seconds for you, what you used to do earlier. Point number two, all right, personalization. Today, you could be two students from MBA on Facebook, yet you will receive personalized communication and content meant for you versus what your friend receives. All right, the AI is intelligent enough to study your psyche, study the way you, you know, the information you you kind of search for, look at what you've been doing on Google, and then it, it creates a certain profile about what it thinks you are, and then it makes sure that it targets you, and you know, it's so from whole broadcasting, we are now narrow casting. From narrow casting, we were always doing that through direct marketing, through one-on-one -on -one marketing, but we are now nanocasting, all right, where it's gone even, you know, I mean, uh, so microscopic that you're being targeted as one individual. So that is one second benefit of AI. Third benefit of AI, all right, is enhanced content creation. Like I told you, uh, chat GPT can help you uh, create, you know, structure sentences, create content, uh, you know, it can help you do quick research. If you want three ways of writing a sentence, it can help you do that. There is something else called Quillbot. Quillbot is a paraphraser. It can help you do that. There is Midjourney, which I use to create this image. And my prompt to this was, I want a robot telling a story to a lady. All right? And I want you to use pinks, blues, and grays. <coughs> and this is what came out. So a robot telling a story to a lady, all right, so on one hand you have her with a cup of coffee or a cup of tea, which is a very traditional image, on the other side you have this robot, he's reading out a story from a computer, and you know, I mean, uh, my brand colors are pink and blue, so I wanted them to be pink, blue, and gray, and it's as if it's made for my brand. So that's how, you know, AI can help you create, customize, you know, enhance uh, content. Not only that, how many of you remember the, 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 the ad Cadbury's did with Shah Rukh Khan? Where Shah Rukh Khan was helping uh, shops during the time of COVID when they were not able to sell. Shah Rukh Khan, they used AI where Shah Rukh Khan's voice and his persona was used as if he's talking about the Kirana or the Bakala store next to you. Alright, but Shah Rukh Khan wasn't recorded doing that. 
he was just recorded doing a few things and then AI was fed all the information of these stores. So Cadbury's wanted to give back to the trading community by showing, by employing Shah Rukh Khan to do their advertising. So which Batala or which uh, Kirana store, sorry Batala is an Arab, Arabic uh, thing, which Kirana store or you know small uh, grocery store can afford ha having Shah Rukh Khan, uh, but that was Cadbury's treat to him. And then you know you started seeing ads on your local satellite channels or your local mohallas that were actually advertising you know um, X, Y, and Z you know grocery store that you buy your bread uh, from every day. That was again uh, a use of uh, AI. They're also saying that maybe tomorrow you might have movies that are shot with no real actors. There will be created people, created images created, uh, you know, uh, things. So when you see things like uh, <coughs> Rainfall, what is that movie that became the first movie which was uh, uh, the, ma the, the macho guy with the on the elephant and all of that? Huh? Bahubali. Bahubali. All right. Bahubali was the start of all of this. All right. For example, look at the amount of, you know, computer graphics and the amount of content creation that has happened and a lot of it was done uh, you know by AI so that is another thing that AI will do uh, audience engagement analysis in terms of understanding how many what is the effectiveness of your media campaign again we were doing all of this but it was done in a manual format now it happens in real time I mean so while your campaign is being released at the same time, the client starts getting the effectiveness of the campaign and is able to then adjust, you know, I mean, uh, campaign strategy uh, accordingly. Point number five, all right, optimize distribution, knowing where, when, what time. So when I put a post on LinkedIn, all right, I, uh, if all of you don't follow uh, me on LinkedIn, and if after this session you don't, I will feel offended, right? So, but you will see that I put posts on LinkedIn and LinkedIn I have an AI tool that tells me the best time and the day to post so that there is a chance of maximum visibility all right so in my case based on my target audience definition my best days to post are Tuesdays and Thursdays all right either between 9 30 to 12 or 4 30 to 6 all right, and then I realized that's the time when people uh, have got into office, had their first cup of tea, had their first meeting, and then you know, generally take a challenge and then they start looking at you know LinkedIn and things like that. So optimize distribution, and then uh, the sixth one, which is interactive narratives. You know, basically now you have chatbots. So do you know that a lot of call centers that you have are not real people? All right. They talk to you with the same voice as a real person. They, in fact, even have the accent of where you're calling from, <clears throat> so you'll feel as if it's somewhere close by. But they're actually chatbots. So this whole interactive interaction is also something that is done by uh, by AI. And the last one, which I think <clears throat> is the most important contribution that AI can make to storytelling, and that is predictive storytelling. So before a trend becomes a trend, AI lets you know that this has potential of becoming a trend. And as a brand owner, you have the advantage of, you have the first mover advantage of starting or telling that story first. So to me, this is the most important, you know, uh, <coughs> aspect of AI in storytelling. But Having said all of this, like I said, storytelling is the heartbeat of humanity, it's shared humanity. It's our way of connecting uh, ourselves. Shairi is a form of uh, storytelling. All right? uh, it's, it's our human connection. I mean, if, uh, I'm sure that you know, uh, one of the things you suffer when you go to jail is not being able to tell a story or not having someone who can listen to your story and that's why you start seeing people in the jail doing things on the wall right? uh, uh, because it's, it's, a, it's a deep human need. So 
at the end of the day, as they say, the universe is not made of atoms. All right, it is made of stories, uh, and that is something that we have to recognize as we bring this to brand storytelling. Any questions so far? Because I have a question after this. All right. I think uh, just for the sake of time, we'll come back to the Q and A later. But what is brand storytelling to you? Don't answer this question. Watch this commercial, and then I will ask you the same question again. From there, one answer from there, one answer from here. Yes. Actions. Okay. Yes, it has actions and it has emotions, but it still does not define what storytelling is. Actions and emotions are part of storytelling, not a definition of its identity. Sorry. Connectivity among the people. It's an outcome of storytelling. It still doesn't define the identity of Sony. Sorry, Red Cap. Oh, conveying an idea. Conveying an idea. Storytelling is a vehicle, but it still doesn't define the identity of story. Who express what is happening? Storytelling is a form of expression, <coughs> not. It is not just writing a story and telling someone what has actually happened. It's about making them feel it. It's making them feel it. Okay, it is the effect of storytelling. All right, the uska asar kya hai? Okay, good. What else? Emotional vibe that maybe must connect with that. Emotional. Emotional vibe. Okay. Okay. Something about telling. For example, the thing that you have to give and give or without the to give a clear picture of uh, what is there in your mind and communicate it to the other person. Yeah, but you know, there is you as the storyteller. The effectiveness of the story is when it sits well in the mind of the receiver. All right. So it's not about what you want to do. It's also about how that person receives the story. Anyway, we we'll, like I know good attempts for the sake of time. We'll just uh, so. It's the chronicle of a character who wants something and endures a series of obstacles in order to get what they want. All right. So it is there is no story without a problem, and there is a hero that has to solve that problem, and then there is a climax in that solving that problem, and then there is that wow, मतलब you know, and there is that suspense of oh will he be able to do it? Will he not be able to do it? Will he do it or will he do it? You know who's going to do it? And that is what is great about a story. A story makes a promise to the audience that it will take them on a journey in order to teach them something. जो असर की बात आप कर रहे थे, वो at the end of the day it's a form of what you learned 
out of i told you two of my stories at the end of the day i told you there was a problem there was a challenge i had to overcome that challenge i told you i gave you the climax and in the end you all clapped all right because you felt good that there was this story where this guy was able to solve a problem which many people are not able to solve all right so there is no story without a problem without a hero so there are three c's in storytelling conflict characters climax all right conflict characters climax agar aapko urdu kahani ya afsanon ka shauk hai aap kisi bhi acche lekhak ko kisi bhi acche writer ko dekhe aapko dekhega story ke plot mein conflict hoga एक कुछ कैरेक्टर्स होंगे उनकी तस्वीरें बनाई जाएंगी आपको लेवल यू नो एंड देन देयर इज अ सर्टेन क्लाइमैक्स इन टर्म्स ऑफ हाउ दैट स्टोरी इज स्टिक लेट्स लेट्स पुट दिस इन टू एग्जांपल आई एम गोइंग टू गिव यू फोर सिनेरियोस हियर ऑलराइट आई वांट यू टू मीट बेला ऑलराइट बेला इन द ग्रैंड सर्कस अ टाइनी एलिफेंट बेला परफॉर्म ट्रिक्स दिस इज नैरेटिव ए नैरेटिव बी दैट प्लस टुडे इज ट्यूसडे ऑलराइट narrative c in the grand circus a tiny elephant bella longed to graze in the plains she wasn't fond of show business train tricks cage train and on it went until one night a violent storm attacked the big top the tent collapsed causing a panic amidst the chaos bella's cage door sprang open she hesitated let bella traverse the forests and rivers until she found sanctuary in a vast elephant reserve bella now grazes freely with a new fam all right narrative b in the grand circus a tiny elephant bella flourished in her life each day she delighted audiences with her graceful performances under the big top <coughs> a trainer and fellow circus performers cared for her with love and respect she lived in harmony with the circus family breaking the warmth of their camaraderie Bella's life was a testament to the magic of the circus where happiness reigned supreme. These are four narratives. What sounds like a story to you? Why? Brilliant, wonderful. I'm so proud of you because there is conflict, there is a character and there is a climax, all right? But in D what is missing? There's no conflict. All right, it's all very hunky dory. Life is all, and there's, it's not interesting. It's like, yeah, okay, so what, you know? But when you start telling C, that's when. So this is the architecture of storytelling. And when you sit down with your pen as a copywriter, and you have to write a script, or you have to write even a presentation, all right, to a, a corporate presentation, this is the logic that you have to follow. What is the conflict? All right. what was the who are the characters how will this happen and you know so in presentation writing for example one of the plots that i use is where am i today where do i want to go how do i get there all right and fourth one is what are the barriers that could prevent me from getting there so it's simple that's again following the same logic in storytelling uh, you know a uh, plot so you've got the whole you've got the whole thing all right Now let me tell you, take you through it from a brand perspective. All right, in brand storytelling, the first thing is the user and the audience. Who are you talking to? All right, you have to understand the mindset of who you're talking to. Not in terms of demographics and psychographics, that's important, but in stuff in terms of values, which is values, attitudes, lifestyle. What are their pain points? What are their aspirations? You know, it took me a lot of practice. But when I was managing brand wheel, I could shut my eyes and see myself as a woman in Eastern UP, all right, of a certain income group, and I could feel what she's feeling, because that is how I trained myself. It's not about me. It's not for me. It's about the target audience for whom this communication is being made, and you have to get under the skin of that consumer and understand the consumer. So, what is the problem? All right. So, what is the problem that you are trying to solve? All right. Or what are the challenges uh, that you are trying to solve? Or what are the opportunities that you are trying to exploit? All right. Then, 
she, how is she going to use your service or product? How does that, you know, how does the use of your service and product solve that problem? And then, what's the solution? So, what's the solution that your product or service provides that person? Leading them to take what action? All right. So, once they're convinced, what is the action you want them to take? And then, which creates what kind of result for them? And finally, making them feel an emotion. All right. So, this is the journey of how brand storytelling actually happens. Now, when brands fall on their faces or campaigns fail, they fail because some link somewhere was broken. All right. The logic did not lead from one thing to another. Or let me simplify it for you and, and, and kind of give it to you in another way. And that is, this is a st seven step brand story framework, as we call it. And this is how copywriters, or this is what copywriters use in the back of their minds too when they, you know, uh, write certain copy. So first, there's a hero, all right? And then you have a problem, and there is a guide, there is a plan, there is certain action, there is an outcome, and there is a transformation that is delivered. So how does this work? So let's put it this way. There's a hero who wants something, which is your customer. So the hero is not your brand. The hero is the customer. So the hero wants something. All right. Next, the hero encounters a problem before they get what they want. All right. It's not there for the taking. They have to earn it. All right. So what's the problem? And then a guide steps in, which is your brand. All right. To help them win. Okay. Finally, the guy gives them a plan to overcome that problem. So, tomato ke dal hain. Ab isko soak kijiye. Ab ye kijiye. Aur dal bhunte re jaoge. You know, that's a plan. All right. The guy calls the hero into action. They never take action on their own. So, the guy the brand is actually calling the consumer into action and saying, this is what I, you should be doing, or this is how you could solve your problem. That action helps them avoid failure and ends in success and you, you know, the outcome. And finally, at the end, the story results in the hero's transformation. So, it's very complicated and it is extremely easy. Alright? Complication is in the you know, in the significance it has and the potential it has in terms of what it can do for you, do for your business, but the actual implementation is damn easy. It's, you know, it's, you just have to, you know, when I joined Lintas, one of the things we had to do uh, as, uh, as account executives was we had to judge creative work. When the creative team developed the creative campaign, we had to see it and give an opinion. And we were given a acronym called SPURS, S-P-U-R-S. Does it have a selling idea? Is it persuasive? Is it unexpected? Is it relevant to a consumer inside? Is it simple enough for you to go and explain it to your grandma? All right, SPURS. Now, initially, it used to be, you know, you had... But then after a while, it became second nature. And I would see a campaign and I would immediately, without having to, you know, strain my mind in terms of thinking spurs, you would, so this is the same thing. Storytelling, you know, initially, you might have to start, you know, kind of checking yourself in terms of process. But then if you ask anybody, you know, I'm sure uh, Paris Saab is a, uh, is a child and he loves a lot of poetry. If you ask him to dissect a lot of the poems and a lot of the shares that he loves, he might be able to find all these elements in there, or at least most of these elements, you know, uh, in there. If you look at Ghalib or you look at Allama Iqbal or any of those big poets, they all had problems that they were trying to talk about, address, and you know, it is that's why those, you know, shares today, or you look at the best uh, afsanas that you, you might you might have read, all of them have this. Now, the reason why storytelling works is that there is a neuroscience involved in it. It's not just a creative art form. There is a biological process that happens. After a film dialogue, chemical locha, 
chemical locha, everybody knows what is chemical locha. When you somebody behaves in a slightly awkward manner, they kaha jata hai kare iska chemical locha challa hai. Mutlab iske hormones kuch up and down, you know, I mean, uh, chal rahe hai. So chemical locha is actually a real thing. All right, when you hear a great story, all right, there is a certain synchronized brain activity and emotion. So it, 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 it induces neural coupling and the storyteller's brain patterns starts connecting. Why is it that you go for a silly Govinda movie, at least I used to? Go for a silly Govinda movie and then you would come back saying, yeah, I'm you know? Because for three hours you were able to kind of, you know, suspend your, you know, your reality and your brain coupled itself to immerse you in that situation and you became part of the story. The release of hormones, so it's dopamine release, oxytocin release, these are certain hormones that are released in our brain when you exercise and you work out, this dopamine is called the happy, happy, happy happiness hormone. All right, you, really, you feel that. When you hear a good story, you also feel that surge of happiness and pleasure because what's really happening is dopamine is being released in your in your brain. All right, or uh, you know, it's the sensory motor cortex activation. Sometimes when you hear uh, you're watching a good story, your hand is almost or when you hear a great you know kind of musical theme, your feet start you know, uh, tapping. What is happening? It's basically your sensory motor cortex, you know, kind of getting you involved in that story. And then, you know, uh, it, what it also does is it, it helps you, it takes you away from rationality. 